Perfect. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Venture Cafe for bringing me over here for a very unique kind of talk, being virtual and talking about science. Uh, you know, usually these things happen in big rooms where there's lots of people sitting in seats, but uh, now we're all back at our homes, having a drink maybe, back at our house, eating dinner, uh, sitting with your legs kicked up, sitting on a couch, whatever it might be. So this is a unique experience. The one thing I do want to say is that I'd like to keep it a little bit casual since it's really not a large group, it seems, if you have any questions, literally, just unmute yourself and start yelling at me. I'm perfectly fine with stopping my presentation and then going in and answering any questions. Um, so let me just share my screen. Because again, you know, a lot of this ends up being this like fun experience where you can kind of get the sense of an audience and then respond to them and then see if you're going a little bit too quickly. So I'm just going to say, if you have any questions, just raise your voice and I'll be able to hear you because I can't see you since I'm sharing my screen. Uh, but again, just stop me at any moment. I'm going to, I have always have way too many slides too. So we're going to see if we can get through some stuff, show you some cool things uh, and make this interesting for everybody before they go on, on with their night. Uh, so my name is Dr. Nathan Freed. You can find me at Twitter at Neuron Nate, at Neuron Nate. Uh, I am at the Department of Biology at Rutgers University Camden. And today I'm giving a talk about using light to understand the brain and the therapeutic future of optogenetics, which is really a technique, because that's really what this talk is all about today, is technological advances in neuroscience to help us better understand how the brain actually works. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, picture from an artist, Eero Lampinen, who did this work for a news article about optogenetics I think that this work is just it's so fantastic and it's really demonstrating this idea of using this new technology to kind of peer into the brain a little bit more to understand it a little bit better. So sit back, relax, let's learn something kind of cool and interesting. So fundamentally, the thing that neuroscientists are all very, very interested in understanding is really how the brain works. How does it produce the behaviors that we have how does it produce the human experience? And why do we do what we do on a psychological level? Like, why is it that we might get angry in certain situations or get excited in other situations? And then how does that ultimately drive the behaviors that we have as an individual and also as, uh, as groups of individuals in a society? And so we can look at questions by observing animal behavior. We can look at primates, fruit flies even, because they share a lot of emotional and neurological processing that we actually have. We can look at mice or crabs. These are all images of them from frontiers in neuroscience fighting each other. And we can garner information from those organisms to better understand our own physiology, our own experiences. But fundamentally, the question that neuroscientists are most interested in is why we do the things that we do, and then how do we accomplish those things? Um, so it really comes down to trying to understand how neural activity patterns, so how neurons in a brain fire in certain ways to then drive certain behaviors, certain natural behaviors that we might have. You know, is there a subset of neurons that are responsible for individual behaviors, or is there a large group of neurons that are responsible for all behaviors, but it depends on the firing patterns that they might have that can drive those behaviors. And at the end of the day, we can break these things out. So this is, again, some really nice art from Greg Dunn. He's uh, he was actually getting his PhD in neuroscience over at the University of Pennsylvania. And during his PhD, he made the decision that, you know, he doesn't really want to sit behind a bench for the rest of his life. And instead, he went and pursued an artistic career and has created these amazing micro-etching uh, portraits of, of different things that are related to uh, the brain, primarily the brain, primarily neuroscience topics, but also other things in human biology. But, you know, we want to understand, like, how does the brain actually work? Like, how do these neurons talk to each other to formulate this experience that we have? And then fundamentally, too, how does it all fall apart when it comes to neurodegenerative disorders? So something like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, how do those things fall apart to no longer allow us to do the behaviors that we're interested in doing? And how do they malfunction? So whether, whether it's congenital, so you're born with a particular malfunction, or things change over time from the environment that you're experiencing. How does your neural pathways become mal, uh, malfunction to then change your behavior? Because ultimately, though, it's all about behavior. And, you know, I really like breaking down the brain into simple 
aspects, like things that we can all just very inherently understand. And you can do that actually by thinking about the nervous system. So the brain, whether it's the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system, is broken down to the three components. One is sensory input. In this picture, this eyeball sees a glass of water and it thinks to itself, or it sees that, has that information that gets sent into the brain to the second stage, which is called integration. So it integrates the information that's coming in from the outside world. So it says, I can see that water and it assesses, do I want that water? Am I thirsty? Should I drink that water? And then it can integrate that sensory input with its own internal state and then make a decision of what the motor output is gonna be, where it says, now go ahead and reach for that glass of water and drink. So if you really break down this whole thing of like, you know, the complex human brain and everything, it comes down to three different components, into input, integration, and then finally output. And the question that we have is, what are the neurons that do this? What are the neurons that allow us to perform this experiment? What are the areas of the brain that are important for these different functions? And really at the end of the day, there's a few types of ways that we can actually answer those questions to figure out how do these complex sensory networks or how do these complex neuronal networks really come together to allow us to have this experience. And so the experiments that we can do is one, we can get rid of a certain part. We can cut it out. You can pop it out. There's that famous study of uh, an individual getting a, a pipe stripped through his head and then he completely changed his entire behavior. What that told us was certain parts of the brain, certain parts of the limbic system, the hippocampus allows us to generate memories. So there's all of these anecdotal studies in the clinical world of neuroscience really looking at if you get rid of a certain part of the brain, what function do you lose? And that can tell us a lot about how is this information getting processed in the brain? What parts of the brain are really important to understand? Another way we can do this too is we can zap certain parts of the brain to activate certain neurons because neurons are essentially electrical circuits. You can kind of think of them in that way, in a very simplistic way. And you could put an electrode in a certain part of the brain, pass a little bit of a current through that part, and then you can get stimulation of those neurons. And you can say, ah, you know, if I activate this part of the brain, I get this behavior or I get this experience. And actually, this is interesting because when somebody is going under surgery, when they have uh, brain surgery, a lot of times they're actually awake, especially if they're removing a tumor. And so what they do is they, the person's awake, the brain can't feel anything. It's called asensate, it has no sensation. And then you end up having a neurosurgeon that if they're trying to remove uh, a tumor from a part of the brain that's involved in language processing, they'll tell the person to just start talking. So that they know if they accidentally start to cut away a part of the brain that they really shouldn't be cutting away because that language that that person's producing starts to change and become modified. So again, we can stimulate, we can remove to figure out what parts of the brain are involved in what processes. Another thing that we can do too is we can measure the activity of individual neurons. And we can say this is done with like fMRI and other types of technologies, but we can lower down an electrode that doesn't electrically stimulate an area, but instead it records the electrical activity in that part of the brain. And we can say when this person is drinking water, this part of the brain becomes active and we can get an assessment of that. One of the challenges with that though is that if you're using fMRI to look at the entire brain, it's not very specific. So you're looking at large areas of the brain, which will have several, several, like hundreds of thousands of neurons within a certain little area. Um, and if you're using an electrode, lowering that down into the brain, you're only recording from a single neuron at the same exact time. Or at most, you might use a tetra and you might record from eight to 10 neurons at the same time. It becomes really, really hard to understand. But fundamentally, there's another really, really big challenge here. This is where optogenetics comes in, is that you look at a specific part of the brain that part of the brain is made up of so many, so many, so many neurons. And the hard part about it too is that they're all different types of neurons. They're not all the same. It's a heterogeneic mixture of neurons. And they have input coming in from multiple areas and they're sending their output into other parts of the brain, all over the brain. It's not a simple circuit where you just have one input, you have your little neuron and then it sends an output. The complexity is so incredibly vast. And this is the problem I want you to kind of think about. If we have such complexity in different parts of the brain, how is it that we're going to be able to figure out not just what does this one area of the brain do, but what does the specific blue neurons do? What are the yellow neurons do? What are the individual neurons doing within that section of the brain? And that's where optogenetics comes in. 
So just to kind of like really reiterate this too, this image right here is from a paper that we published in 2019 with colleagues of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, where we're, we're illuminating what's called the dorsal root ganglion. This is all the cell bodies, so the, the actual body of the neuron, that uh, run along your spinal cord. And it's where all the sensory input comes in. So each one of these tiny little dots is an individual neuron. And what you can kind of appreciate here is that if I stain this with different types of colorful markers that identify different types of neurons, you end up seeing that there's all these different neurons that have different things. Like this is not just a single, like if you look at panel C, H, or M, this is not just one area of the brain is like all the neurons are doing the same exact thing. They are all packed together. They're heterogeneic, they're segregated. And we can look right here on this other image, which is uh, a, a cross section of a rat brain, like a diagram of this. And we can look at these different areas marked as NAC, BSTOV, LSV, PVN. Again, it demonstrates that within each area of the brain, like the hippocampus, that we all kind of hear about when it comes to memory, there are individual different types of neurons that are doing different functions. And so it really illuminates this idea that using an electrode and putting an electrode in a particular part of the brain, you're not just going to activate that part of the brain, you're going to activate every type of neuron that is inside of that part of the brain which becomes hard. If you scoop out a part of the brain, then you're not doing an effective experiment because you're scooping out all different types of connections. So it becomes a very, very big challenge for us. So really that's what comes into this concept of optogenetics. And we gotta ask ourselves then, what is optogenetics? And we can step back and we can answer certain questions. We can split this word apart. And again, for anybody who has just come in, stop me at any moment, just turn your microphone on and say, hey, Nate, calm down, like go slower, go back. I have a question for you. It's perfectly fine. You can interrupt me. We'll keep this casual. So what is optogenetics? We can split this up and we can ask ourselves, what is opto and what is genetics? Opto is light, right? Like that makes sense. Optics, opto is light and genetics is our DNA. So optogenetics is the use of light and the use of genetics to control neuronal function. We'll go into that a little bit more. So these are these tiny little organisms that exist in lakes, in rivers, uh, a whole host of things. They are green algae. And these green algae, they move around, they have these complex behaviors. They are single cell organisms, which is really interesting if you think about that, because these single cell organisms also feature complex behavior. So one of their behaviors is that they like to swim towards light or sometimes they like to swim away from light, depending on the time of day and their exposure to light, all with the goal of either finding food or avoiding predation. So these green algae, they can see light with this little thing right here, you can see with the white arrow, which is really like this eye hole, basically. So this eye on this single cell organism is able to see that light and then decide, should I swim towards the light or should I swim away from light? So several years ago, there was a group of physicists who discovered how these green algae do that. And what they found was that there was a special protein called chenorhodopsin, CHRT, as we see right here. And this chenorhodopsin was expressed in that little eye hole. And what that chenorhodopsin protein is, is a transmembrane protein, meaning a protein that sits within the membrane of the cell in the sigma cell organism. And whenever light hits it, it opens up and it allows ions to flow through that channel to go into the, into the green algae. So if you have a green algae and you have a little eye hole right here, and then all of a sudden it's like swimming around and it experiences an influx of ions into this part of its body, then it knows that the light is coming in from over there and it can make a decision. Should I swim towards the light? Should I swim away from the light? So this thing is able to see, not with the complex eyes that we have, but with a single protein on its cell surface called channel rhodopsin, channel rhodopsin. So at the same time these physicists were doing this type of research, neuroscientists were really getting frustrated with the technologies that we have to study the brain. And so, like I said before, our primary way of studying the brain is to say, well, what part of the brain does what? How does it do that? And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to drop an electrode into a particular part of the brain, and we're just going to stimulate that part of the brain, and we're going to see what happens to the animal. 
but they're becoming frustrated because it doesn't really give high resolution. Because when you stimulate with an, electro with an electrode, you're activating all the neurons in that local area. But what if, if you have these two different neurons, what if you're only interested in understanding the function of the neuron that's uh, the lower neuron, and you're not interested in that upper neuron? With an electrode, you activate both of the neurons, and it becomes a problem. So a physicist and a neuroscientist walk into a bar, and what they do is they decide, what can we do together? How could we come with our individual experiences and do collaborative work to understand the brain better? So they asked themselves, what if we could genetically engineer neurons to see light? What if we could take that chenorhodopsin protein that's found in green algae, take the gene of that and put it into a neuron? Maybe then we could increase the resolution and then increase our ability to target specific neurons. So what is optogenetics? It's genetically engineering neurons to see light in the same exact way a green algae sees light. So the way that they do this is, like I said, we have chenorhodopsin that sits on the cell surface of a green algae cell. We can take the gene that produces that protein, because it goes gene, mRNA, and then protein. So we take the chenorhodopsin gene, and we can genetically encode it into neurons of any type of animal that we want to do this, including humans, which is really where we get this therapeutic and clinical relevance. And we can insert that DNA into specific neurons within the brain. Uh, and when I say specific neurons, each of the neurons within our brain has a certain genetic code. And we've identified the genetic code of those neurons. And by understanding the genetic code of those neurons, we can say we only want chenorhodopsin to be inside of the neuron that leaves from the hypothalamus and goes to the hippocampus, as opposed to the neuron that leaves the hypothalamus and goes to the cortex. We can specifically identify individual neurons and make it so that those single neurons are responsive to light. And so then what happens is that because we know that neurons communicate by firing electrical signals and then releasing a neurotransmitter, we can now shine a blue light onto this individual neuron and then have it fire its own action potential. So with the right combination of neurons, you can activate an entire brain circuit to control specific behaviors, or you can activate specific circuits to then ask, what is this specific circuit doing? And this is something we didn't have before. If any of you in the audience are coders out there and you try to figure out why is my code breaking or why does this code do whatever it's supposed to be coding to do, the obvious thing you do is you run an experiment where you remove line by line that code to identify what is the problem within my code or what does this particular line do in this code to allow for this function to happen. So before this, it would have been like, all you could do was delete the entire file of code or write entire new file of code. But now with optogenetics, you can go line by line or even letter by letter and determine what does each line of this code actually accomplish. So like I said, what is optogenetics? Initially, we had electrical stimulation as our go-to way to study the function of a brain. But with optogenetics, we can target specific neurons, not all the neurons in a particular area, and then take a fiber optic cable and activate only that one specific neuron. And the cool thing, too, is that those physicists kept on working. They didn't just find a special ion channel, chenorhodopsin, that allows for the activation of neurons. They found one, too, called archirhodopsin that allows for the inhibition of neurons. So now with this suite of information, or suite of tools, you could say, we can go in and start saying very, very precise questions, or asking very precise questions about what is a particular circuit doing for the human experience. And really, it just comes down to this beautiful idea that these neurons have been genetically coded to be able to see light. So the reason I'm giving this talk today for, for this venue is because when I first learned about this in grad school, I was blown away. I felt like this was science fiction. I still feel that way, that we have this ability to lower down an electrode or lower down a fiber optic cable that flashes blue light. And we can send cascades of neuronal activity in whatever way that we have designed the experiment to do. And so there's a lot of like really, really cool things for this. Um, so this is all just like going back to this idea that our, we have sensory input, we have integration and motor output as the fundamental function of the nervous system. 
And, you know, to really put this into perspective too, it's not just these simple things like I'm thirsty, I want to drink water, but you can think about all of this stuff, like jealousy, rage, um, hunger, pain, other neurocognitive things, all of these things fundamentally break down to these three processes. You have sensory input, I see somebody doing something, you have integration, I'm gonna integrate what I'm looking at and I'm gonna to try to think about what does that mean to me as a person through in my societal environment and I'm gonna integrate that sensory input and then I'm gonna have a motor output. And when I say motor output, I'm not just saying like reach for that glass and drink that water or talk to somebody on the phone. I'm saying things that are even more complex. So the ways that you might change your behavior to make somebody feel a little bit more comfortable when they're around you, or maybe you want to be passive aggressive to somebody, all of those things are behavior, not just motor behavior. There's other things here. So what optogenetics allows us to do is to say, all right, we have a behavior that we're interested in, and now we want to look at the exact specific neurons that are involved in the circuitry that produces this behavior. The tools are unprecedented at this point. And this is what it really looks like. We can take an animal, we can implant a fiber optic cable into their heads, and then we can activate blue light and we can control their behavior, mind control to a certain extent. So activating the area of the brain that induces aggression in a mouse to attack a small bottle cap. So this is an example, this is not my research, this is video from another group, but essentially this is a group studying aggression up in NYU, Langoon Center. And so what this group is interested in is identifying, using optogenetics to identify the specific area of the brain that induces aggression. And so this is a mouse with a fiber optic cable on top of its head, and this is a little bottle, bottle cap. And it might be a little glitchy since it's on Zoom. You can't see the videos perfectly, but hopefully you can kind of see this a little bit once we play this. The light turns on and that mouse rages. It attacks that bottle cap and it stops attacking the bottle cap the instant that the blue light goes off. So these are scientists that have been able to identify not just that a specific area of the brain is involved in aggression, but that specific neurons, when activated with this blue light, are responsible for the function of aggression, you could say. So they've done a lot of other interesting things too, and they really want to understand the specific, uh, the specific neural correlates of every single stage of aggression. And so this is, involves in animals attacking and stopping attacking or identifying the specific animal that it might want to attack. And they can go in and they can control specific circuits down to single cellular level to understand, well, this neuron is involved in this process. Uh, it's really, really remarkable work. And so it's not just the aggression. This is, this is work that can be done with, with uh, learning and memory. There is a group of scientists who have used optogenetics to identify specific regions of the brain that are involved in the formation of memories. And they've even been able to implant false memories into animals who never experienced a fearful uh, event. And when you turn the blue light on, activating those specific neurons, you implant a false memory, quote unquote, you can kind of say, and then it causes that animal to become fearful. And it's not just mice. We can do this in Drosophila. So this is a Drosophila, uh, a little tiny fruit fly sitting on a ball. You can see right there on the right-hand side on the blue ball. They get stationarily placed right there. And the blue ball can float around a little dish of water and it can run to the left, it can run forward. It can't fly or jump away because it's stationary, but it can move in any single direction that it might want to move, almost like those virtual reality things that we've all kind of played around with in the past. And so this one is looking, this study is looking at courtship behavior. And when flies court each other, when they, when they find somebody that they fall in love with or another fruit fly that they fall in love with, they do a certain behavior where they put one wing out and they move that wing in a certain way that actually produces sound that its potential mate can hear. So essentially sings and dances for that fly. And so they identify that there's a specific circuit called the PC1 circuit. And the PC1 circuit is involved in activating this. So this fruit fly, when you just shine a blue light towards its head, because it's been genetically engineered to only activate the PC1 uh, uh, network, whoops, sorry. It starts to do that behavior. You can see on the left-hand video right there, it starts running around, it puts its wing out, and it stops once the blue light turns off. So this is just fascinating that we're able to get this level of animal behavior in these different ways. 
So my research is really, really involved in developing chronic pain, uh, new therapies for chronic pain. Because uh, if I say like my running scientific motivation is that we don't necessarily have an opioid epidemic. What we really have is a chronic pain management epidemic, that there's not really effective ways to treat chronic pain patients, not at least all chronic pain patients. And so it contributes to this over-reliance on opioids. And so, you know, to kind of talk a little bit about how I apply optogenetics to my research, uh, we can say 100 million individuals suffer from some form of chronic pain. That can be lower back pain, severe headache or migraine pain, neck pain, facial pain, uh, a whole gamut of different types of pain. That's a third of the U.S. population, or almost a third of the U.S. population. And 91 Americans are dying each day from opioid overdose. And if you look at the numbers of where, where these individuals, like what types of opioids are they using when they overdose, uh, it's nearly half of those individuals are, are dying from an opioid overdose that was uh, caused by a prescription opioid. So it kind of like really iterates this idea that the prescription opioids are used for chronic pain and we can't treat chronic pain effectively. And so because of that, we have this over-reliance on opioids and that's causing 91 Americans or half of those 91 Americans are dying each and every day uh, from overdose. So to discover new ways to treat pain patients, we have to understand how pain works. You can't treat something if you don't understand the fundamental mechanisms behind how and why it works a certain way. And so we know some general stuff. We know that there's a simple pain pathway that if you hurt yourself and your foot, there's a neuron that sends that information into the spinal cord. So this is step two right here. And then once it's in the spinal cord, it crosses over or it decussates from one side to another side. And then it sends it up through the brainstem into the thalamus and then finally into the cerebrum so that you can process that pain experience. We know that general pathway, but one of the things I remember realizing that was so fascinating was that at the site of injury, we're actually pretty unclear about how that pain signal is actually sent to the brain. We know that there's certain sense organs. We know that there's certain neurons that are coded towards certain types of pain. So we know that there are neurons right there that are responsible for thermal reception or the sense of heat or cold. So if you have painful heat or painful cold, like a match to the skin, or you burn yourself by reaching for something that's too hot, we know that there's a certain type of neuron that sends that information to the brain. You also know that there's uh, certain types of neurons that will become sensitized to the sense of touch when you have pain. So think about that moment when you had sunburn on your skin and you touched your skin. Normally that doesn't hurt, but when you're touching your skin when it's, when it's been burnt, that gentle touch now all of a sudden it feels like excruciating pain. It's called allodynia. So we know that there's touch neurons that are involved in that. We know that there's these free nerve terminals that just kind of go all throughout the skin and send any type of like poking or prodding to the brain so that we can receive that information in the process, what should we do? When we think about that pain, you know, you have the sensory input, you're gonna process the emotional aspect of that pain. Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? And then you have to mount a behavioral response, move your hand or stop being in that environment that's causing so much pain. But generally speaking, we have different types of neurons that detect different types of pain in the skin. But we don't know what's happening when somebody develops chronic pain. We don't know which of these neurons are important to the process and the development of chronic pain, that transition of developing that severe chronic pain that somebody that really becomes a burden for somebody's life. There's so many fundamental questions that we don't actually understand about how this signal is being sent to the brain. And one of the challenges with this is that if I come in with an electrode to try to understand this physiology of this, and I try to activate all these neurons, I can't do them one by one under certain chronic pain conditions. I put an electrode, all of those neurons are going to get activated, regardless of what they are, regardless of what they're involved in. So when we turn to optogenetics, though, it really opens up the opportunity to do the same thing that we do with that old school game called Mastermind, which is essentially going in and trying one single variable, testing to see what happens, replacing that variable, testing a different variable, and going one by one by one by one to create a logical conclusion of which neurons are most important to focus on for different types of pain. So the way that we do that in the lab, this is mostly done over at the University of Pennsylvania uh, during my postdoctoral studies. And now I do this with Drosophila in a different way. So with those tiny fruit flies in a different way, but we genetically engineer mice 
to literally feel blue light using optogenetics. Which is really, again, like it's just feels science fiction-y that I'm able to genetically engineer a mouse so that when I shine a blue light at that mouse, it feels the pain on, or it feels the sensation on the, uh, on the palm of its hand or on its foot. So if you look at this, this is an example of a slow motion video in black and white. Sorry for the lower resolution. It's an older video that we had of us taking animals who were genetically engineered to have touch neurons express that special green algae protein called chenerodopsin. So when we shine a blue light, and again, this is a black and white video, when we shine a blue light at that animal's paw, it feels that blue light and it lifts up its paw and moves it over to the side because it's like, what's touching me? What just tapped me on the shoulder, basically? Or what just tapped me on the foot? So it is responding to us just shining a light at its paw because we're activating those touch neurons, which I just think is such a cool, fundamentally is such a cool and interesting idea that we're genetically engineering these animals to feel light. They have their eyes closed and they can feel the light. You can just imagine, you can just think, what would that sensation be like for you to feel light? So another one too, we can genetically engineer mice to have that special green algae protein in the neurons that allow it to feel spiciness. So the same neurons that allow us to taste uh, chili peppers or other spicy things or other heat sensing things. Uh, they're called TRPV1 neurons and they respond to capsaicin. We can genetically engineer the mice so that when I shine a blue light onto that paw, then that animal can now feel spiciness on its paw and you can see it shakes its paw and it moves its paw around. We do the same thing for itchy neurons, the neurons that are responsible for the sensation of itch. And we can come down with a fiber optic blue light shine it onto the animal's paw or onto its animal's ear, and then it shakes as if it feels a tick crawling into its ear. So we can go one by one, different types of itch neurons, different types of pain neurons, different types of touch neurons, and say, is this particular type of neuron important for the pain state the animal might be in? So at the end of the day, optogenetics, what this is, is we're moving from electrical stimulation to more precise way to activate neurons and ask, are they important for this particular behavior? And when we think about pain processing, it really opens up some interesting avenues because we can start to look and say, well, if we know this particular neuron is involved in this type of chronic pain, that we can take this inhibitory optogenetic protein, Archie Rhodopsin, we can express it in those neurons and we can essentially flip a switch, turn light on, and then it just turns off that neuron. You can imagine the power of that, being able to just not take a pill and not take some other type of therapeutic, but being able to literally flip a light switch on and then your pain goes away. Other things too, we're looking at how do these circuits work? Because we know when you have some forms of pain, you can rub the area, particularly a headache, or if you like stub your, your elbow or your knee or your toe, you go and you rub it. And the reason why that relieves pain is because we know that there's this special circuit called a gate circuit that when you activate touch neurons by touching gently, it actually inhibits pain neurons. Because if you think about what the purpose of pain is, it's to direct your attention to a problematic area. So when you touch that problematic area that might be injured to rub the pain away, then your brain says, okay, he's paid attention to it. The behavior has now moved me over there and it's now turned off that pain. So we could use optogenetics to essentially do that, but do it more efficiently. So instead of you touching the injury, you can just come in with a optogenetic or a laser or a blue light. It's really not like a powerful laser, like a low intensity laser. And you could just shine blue light onto that injury area and that will activate the touch neuron to then inhibit the pain and this gate control theory of pain. So in the not too distant future, this idea is very realistic that we could develop tools to use optogenetics to essentially turn off pain. And so these tools are being developed by one individual, uh, uh, Dr. Jarreau, who has developed this very tiny um, LED light that doesn't need a battery operated anything. It is uh, essentially, it can be turned on uh, through the skin. There's no wires. You just implant this, it's very, very tiny. And you can, you can activate neurons that are inside of an animal who has been genetically engineered again to to respond to this and so this is a study looking at bladder pain in mice 
And this is a little green light right here, close to the bladder of an animal who develops chronic pain in their bladder. And we can see actually this is a Y maze and this is a heat map on the lower right hand side right here. And this is basically showing a heat map of where the mice are at any particular time. And what we can see is that the mouse will choose the left chamber versus the right chamber at basically equal amounts of time. But if you turn on the LED on the right chamber right here, you can see that that is inactivating the pain neurons in the bladder. And so the animal prefers to be in that right chamber arm right there, indicating that the animal is seeing a decrease in its pain. We're flipping on a light switch, we're turning off the pain neurons by doing that, and the animal prefers to be in this right arm chamber right here more than it prefers to be in the left one. Indicating that this is, this is the proof of concept is right here with these animals that they, they ran through in a study in 2017. And so this really comes into this whole question is we have a physicist, we have a neuroscientist walk into a bar, but then they realize that we want to do this for humans. We need a virologist. We need somebody to figure out how do you get, how do you genetically engineer an adult? Because you can genetically engineer, you know, in the embryo development for an animal species or something, but how do you take somebody who's already developed, somebody who's already older, and then get that special gene into their genome? And to do that, you need a virologist. And so groups right now are studying ways to genetically engineer adult animals, including adult humans, to identify a way that we can take a virus, put it in a localized area with gene therapy, and then deliver this special chenerodopsin gene to that particular area to do really remarkable things like restoring vision. So in this one study, a group ended up taking that chenerodopsin gene and putting it into neurons that are in the retina, uh, a retina that was no longer processing information that was degenerated, <coughs> excuse me. And it can, that retina can now see blue light. And so they're doing a similar type of thing to restore hearing in individuals. And then even scent, in rodents, they've been able to essentially deliver that special gene to the um, to the the sensory areas of the brain that process olfaction, so the sense of smell. And now this animal can smell blue light, and they're finding out ways that we can actually use this really intricate and interesting uh, type of technology. And so, you know, I really have this focus on technology, and. Another technology, I just kind of like throw this out there to kind of talk about very briefly, is not just with optogenetics, but there's this other thing called GECIs, genetically encoded calcium indicators. When a neuron fires an action potential, it has a rush of calcium on the inside of that cell. And so there are these special genes that have been designed that produce proteins that illuminate green flashes whenever a neuron fires. And this addresses the other technological hurdle that I brought up earlier, which is we can only record from single neurons at each time, at each moment in time. So it makes it very hard for us to know what activity is changing in a specific circuit. And so with this, they've been able to take zebrafish. It's just these little tiny, cute little fish you can get at the pet shop. And as you can see, there's flashes of individual dots all throughout its brain. And you can see the individual action potentials all across the entire brain. All across this entire brain, you can see which neurons are firing as the animal is experiencing certain things. And again, this is not my research, but this is an interesting gift that I was able to pull. And when you flash something in front of its eyes, as it's swimming through, you get a flash of activity because all these neurons become stimulated. And you can see each and every one of them, which allows us, again, unprecedented ability to identify which neurons are involved in certain things that are occurring around us. But the last thing I'll leave you with is that we have this ability to identify neurons. We have this ability to identify which neurons are firing. We have this ability to turn on certain circuits and say this circuit is involved in this function. To the extent that we've taken what's called C. elegans, a tiny little worm, and we've identified every one of its neurons, 302 neurons, that's it, just 302 neurons in this entire organism. And we've been able to map each and every one of those neurons, yet we still don't understand its basic functions. We still don't understand why it decides to do the movements that it decides to do. We still have no idea 
how that type of thing works. And if we don't know that in the 302 neuron circuit, you know, the idea of us understanding how the human brain works anytime soon is preposterous. 302 neurons, we know every single little thing about those, th those neurons, but we don't understand the, the worm experience any better than we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. However, it is really critical that we develop tools and technology to understand these facets of the human brain or of, of neuroscience, of neurological circuits and systems because that's really what's gonna drive our ability to understand this a little bit more. Um, in fact, the Human Brain Project, that was founded in 2016 uh, through an investment through uh, this, we call it the Obama Brain Project. It's all about not necessarily understanding the human experience, but understanding or developing tools to better ask questions. So optogenetics, calcium indicator dyes, those are all things that are gonna help us to have unprecedented resolution of how these things function. But at the end of the day, we need other ways to ask questions to fully understand the actual human experience. So with that, I'm not gonna take any more of my time. I just wanna thank the undergraduate students who work with me over at Rutgers Camden, uh, who are always working very hard. Brittany, Matt, Kyoshi, Sarah, Jaharia, Jenny, Robert, uh, Ubi, Megan, Sherrick, and Avi, who all work with me on different research projects, uh, ranging from uh, analyzing biases that exist in literature to uh, the way fruit flies process chronic pain. And this work is done over at the Department of Biology at Rutgers University Camden. If you're interested in chatting with me, I'm always happy to have a cool conversation. You can reach me on neuronate.com or neuronate on Twitter. You can find me. I'm very active on social media. I'm always happy to chat with you. Uh, so with that, I'll take any other questions that you guys might have. Nate, I think there was a question in the chat. Sure. So let me see. How do I find those questions? If you scroll to the bottom and you see the little chat. Okay, I see the group. I, I can also read them out if you can't find them. Cool. I see the group chat here. So I see a question here. So do we need genetically engineered human to make the experiments works or to react to blue light, which has been used in planting vegetable to treat fish deformation? Uh, I mean, I would answer that and say, you know, we're going to answer a lot of questions that we need to answer in animal studies, invertebrates, fruit flies, mice, and then eventually we will need to genetically engineer humans to be able to respond to this technology to use it therapeutically. So to understand, we don't need to genetically engineer humans, but to use it, we will need to genetically engineer humans. But that's going to happen through gene therapy in, in adult stages, not, you know, and younger individuals. I do see that something saying that they're raising hands. How do we answer raising hand? Maybe they want to speak. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Wenji. I have a question. Have you ever looked at uh, what the light dosage could have an uh, impact on the, the strength of the of its response? Like is like uh, uh, even it's blue, they could be still uh, the different wavelengths and uh, could be uh, different in the brightness. That you yeah. Expect. Absolutely. I think that's a great question. And so there has been research that's been done to identify what's the wavelengths that these proteins work on. Uh, and blue is this chenardopsin response to blue, but they've even modified genetically the proteins so that some respond to yellow light, some respond to red light, some respond to infrared light. And in terms of intensity, we've actually exp ex uh, explored that to determine what is the amount of power that we need to shine that blue light to elicit uh, the behavior that we're looking at. And if we increase that power, we get an even stronger behavior. And so another group, Clifford Wolf and Harvey uh, Medical School, they actually looked at what's the minimal amount of power to activate a single action potential in a single neuron to essentially get to the point of saying, what would be the minimum amount of power or energy that would be necessary to do this? And what they discovered was that you could actually have no light source at all. Well, you have a light source, but you can genetically engineer a light source. There's this protein called GFP, and you can express GFP, and that small amount of light, very, very small amount of light, would be sufficient to send a single action potential in a particular circuit, which again allows us not to just to control a certain area of the brain, not just a certain circuit within that brain, not just a certain neuron in the brain, but how many action potentials it's gonna send from one location to another location. That's a great question. 
Okay, great. Can, can I have one more question? So have you ever uh, specifically looked at uh, uh, what the light could have an uh, uh, impact on the circadian rhythm? Yeah, so a lot of groups are looking at the different neural circuits that are involved in circadian rhythms. And you can imagine, too, that that ends up being challenging because if you want to understand sleep cycles in an organism, you can't be flashing it with blue light, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why they actually genetically engineered these other types of chenorhodopsin molecules so that uh, mice can't see red light. They can't see red light, so they're not red light sensitive. And so now we have chenorhodopsin that we can shine red light. It doesn't disrupt their visual processing at all because they can't see that, but we can start to control certain areas of the brain with that function. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the question. We have one more in the chat. Sure. So, so I see someone says, instead of trying to understand all 302, why not just manipulate some to achieve certain objectives and motions? Yeah, I mean, like, that's what this technology allows us to do, is to go in and individually modify one neuron after another neuron within the circuit to understand it a little bit more, how all this stuff is coming together. But, you know, fundamentally, it's still the question of how do we... Um, how do we go from the place of knowing every single little thing about that circuit to actually understanding what that circuit produces? And you can think of this again with like coding. I can understand every single zero and one inside some code that might be generated, but how do I go from seeing that to understanding the graphic user interface that is used to produce whatever software, like to produce a Facebook app or to produce something in like an app on your phone? How do you go from that space? And the other question I have here is, any theories about why blue cert causes certain responses? What is the role of colors? Why can't my see red? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. It just comes down to, you know, I'll answer that first question, why can't, or the last question, why can't my see red? Uh, through evolutionary processes. Some animals needed to see blue light or some animals needed to see red light in order to survive in their environment and other animals did not. So if you don't need to see red light, then you don't need to develop uh, photoreceptor cells within your retina to allow you to see that space. Um, you know, some animals see other levels of light and other wavelengths of light that we can't possibly see and we don't perceive. And so the theory about why blue light causes certain responses, it's really less about blue light and more about that we're genetically engineering neurons to respond to blue light. So again, we could choose the light. We could choose those genetically engineered neurons to respond to yellow light or to purple light or to whatever we want to do. But it really goes into this, just this wild idea that we can make these organisms respond to these lights. Of course, very, very happy to be here. So thank you all for being here. I'm happy to stay and answer any questions for as long as you want. Um, but it's always fun to be able to talk to a range of individuals and reach out to me if you have any questions about the brain or anything else. You know, we're going through unprecedented times right now with the coronavirus. I'm not a virologist, but I know plenty. Happy to answer any questions about those things too. Thank you so much. Of course. And um, I have a question if there's, if there's any time left. Um, I just want to know how you got interested in um, what you are currently studying and um, what you know? What you what you teach now? How did you first get interested in this field of of science? Yeah, I so it would come to um, I'm gonna go like really, really far back. It was the X Men. Actually, I have a big X Men tattoo on my chest. Uh, I thought they were so cool. I thought like they were so sciency. You know, Beast was the scientist. Like a superhero is also a scientist. I just thought it was so fascinating to me. And they were particularly interested in genetics because you know I have a certain gene in it modifies your genome and then you develop these superpowers and all and so that's what got me into science initially but what led me to neuroscience specifically was as an undergraduate thinking about pursuing a phd i really sat back and i thought to myself what is it that i talk to my friends on a friday night at a party and the answer to that was the brain the human experience psychology you know those questions were so fascinating to me and they were always things that would generate conversation into the wee hours of the morning. And I thought to myself, you know what, if I can stay up until sunrise with my friends talking about the brain, then that would probably be something that could entertain me for the rest of my life. And so that's what led me on this path of, of uh, neuroscience related topics. And then specifically pain, 
it's just, it's such a huge problem. I come from a small town in, in New Jersey, in Riverside, New Jersey, and there's a huge opioid epidemic there. In Philadelphia, there's a huge opioid epidemic. And it is so fascinating to me to think that uh, a major reason why we have this, this big challenge in our community is that there are not sufficient pain medications for patients. And so I thought to myself, that would be a really interesting uh, direction to go to pursue my interests in neuroscience and help humanity as much as I can. Great, thanks for sharing. Of course, yeah. All right, thank you again, Nate, for this very fascinating presentation and thank you all for attending and the great questions as well. Um, there's a couple of other Venture Cafe programs going on, so feel free to, to jump in another session. Um, and thanks again. Cool. Nice to see everybody.